So we're continuing our short video lecture series and we're going to talk about water quality and pollution. I'd like to speak to the specifics of emerging contaminants of concern. These chemicals include human and veterinary drugs, including antibiotics, natural and synthetic hormones, detergents, metabolites, plasticizers, insecticides, and fire retardants. One or more of these chemicals were found in 80% of the streams that were sampled by the U.S. Geological Survey. Half of the streams contain seven or more of these chemicals, and about one-third of the streams contain ten or more of these chemicals. This study is the first national-scale examination of these organic wastewater contaminants in streams and supports the USGS mission to assess the quantity and quality of the nation's water resources. A more complete analysis of these other emerging contaminants of concern is ongoing. Another study in the southeast U.S. was conducted by the USGS. The USGS sampled 59 small streams in portions of Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia for 108 different pharmaceutical compounds and they detected one or more pharmaceuticals in all 59 streams that were sampled. The average number of pharmaceuticals detected in the streams was six. The most common pharmaceuticals that were detected were metformin. This is used to treat type 2 diabetes and this chemical was detected in 89 percent of the samples. Lidocaine was also detected. It's used as a pain reliever. It was detected in 38 percent of the samples. Acetaminophen, used as a pain reliever, was, det was detected in 36% of the samples. Carbamazepine was used to treat seizures, and this was detected in 28% of the samples. Fexofenadine, used as an antihistamine, was detected in 23% of the samples. And Tramadol, an opioid pain reliever, was detected in 22% of the samples. So what's going on is that these pharmaceuticals and personal care products can make their way through our modern day wastewater treatment plants because those wastewater treatment plants are not equipped to remove the PC PPCPs. So they can get into the environment via wastewater discharge into streams and rivers where the treatment doesn't actually remove them. They can also get into the environment by applying sewage sludge to land as biosolids and they can get into the environment by using treated wastewater or reclaimed water as irrigation water for our crops. One thing to note is that these chemicals are known to be endocrine disruptors and they, in, they can interfere with natural hormones of aquatic living organisms and wildlife. So it's definitely an emerging contaminant of concern that the USGS is continuing to study. We don't have any standards for these in terms of Clean Water Act standards for surface water bodies or safe drinking water standards for water that is consumed by people. These are definitely new contaminants of concern which are currently undergoing more study and the concentrations that they are found in the environment in our water bodies is in the parts per trillion in very small small amounts. However, again, we're not certain as to the ecological impact of these as endocrine disruptors and if a part per trillion could bioaccumulate or biomagnify up the food chain. So let's define what pollution is. I just mentioned an emerging contaminant of concern. So pollution is defined as the presence of a substance in the environment that because of its chemical composition or quantity prevents the functioning of natural processes and produces undesirable environmental and health effects. So the PPCPs in the environment, if we determine that they're causing um, impact to aquatic life species from an endocrine disruptor scenario, then that qualifies them to fall under the category of a pollutant. So there are different sources of pollution to surface water as well as groundwater and we're going to focus on surface water first. In general pollution comes from either municipal, industrial, or non-point sources. 
In this slide, I refer to them as point sources and non-point sources. Point sources are discrete, easily identifiable, and controlled locations of concentrated pollution discharge. An example of a point source was in the previous slide with the pipe that's discharging discolored water into the water body. This might be a wastewater treatment discharge, possibly. We use the term effluent to refer to any water that's discharged from a pipe into a stream or river or lake or reservoir. Effluent is defined as the wastewater that is the result of a process, like a treatment process, and is discharged from a source into a surface water body. The other category of sources of surface water pollution is non-point sources. These are less discrete causes of water pollution. They currently contribute about two-thirds of the pollutants which end up in our streams. They are also the largest source of water pollution, and control of these sources is often difficult and expensive. So, this picture here is um, a livestock feedlot, and from the livestock lot we have water running off that has high concentration of animal feces, and that's running directly into the storm drain, which is getting a direct connection into a nearby stream or surface water body. In terms of enforcement, it's far easier for our government to put into place laws that enforce requirements on our point sources of discharge, like an industrial facility that's discharging something from their treatment process or a wastewater treatment plant. So it's far easier for governments to force a company to install a pollution control device on a factory than to try to force tens of thousands of city dwellers to get oil leaks in their cars fixed. That's another example of non-point source pollution. Or it's also more difficult to enforce that ten thousands of community residents uh, apply their pesticides properly to their lawns. So the EPA estimates that 50 to 70 percent of the impaired surface waters in the United States are affected by non-point source pollution from agricultural activities as well as urban runoff from our roads and parking lots and commercial lots. Um, those are the second most common source of non-point source pollution. And these pollutants from urban runoff will include salts, oil, toxic metals, and materials such as gasoline and asbestos. So let's look at sources of groundwater pollution. The diagram in the top right corner depicts how groundwater occurs in the subsurface in an unconfined freshwater aquifer and a confined freshwater aquifer. It also depicts various examples of sources to groundwater pollution. Many people think of groundwater as a fast-flowing underground river, but nothing could be farther from the truth. Your textbook describes the occurrence of groundwater with several terms in the various zones of our subsurface, such as the unsaturated zone, the vado zone, the saturated zone, and aquifer. So groundwater supplies about one-fifth of our annual water demand in the United States and drinking water for over half of the United States population. In rural areas, groundwater supplies 95% of the drinking water, not surface water. In the 30 years from 1950 to 1980, our groundwater withdrawals actually increased by 150%, meaning we increased our reliance on groundwater over surface water. Obviously, all these uses put a high demand on our groundwater resources, and in addition, it's essential that our groundwater is kept clean and usable. So groundwater moves really slow, about two inches a day to maybe two feet per day at the max. Because ground, groundwater moves so slowly, it can take years for polluted water in one location to appear in another. Additionally, once groundwater is contaminated, it can take several hundred years for it to cleanse itself as it moves through the aquifer material. So the primary sources of groundwater contamination in the U.S. are leaking underground storage tanks, private septic tanks in rural areas, agricultural um, runoff or seepage into the subsurface, and landfills. Also depicted on the picture is different types of waste lagoons uh, and mining sites as well. Currently, according to the U.S. Geological Survey, about 1% of the drinking water wells 
are contaminated, and this amounts to about 8,000 private, public, and industrial wells. So the other issue with groundwater pollution is that it's really difficult to detect groundwater pollution, and it's expensive and time-consuming. Numerous test wells have to be drilled to sample the water and determine the rate and direction of groundwater flow. Cleaning up the contaminated water is expensive and might take a very long time, sometimes 10, 20, 30 years. Preventing groundwater contamination is the cheapest way to prevent this vital resource from becoming contaminated and it's an essential element in creating a sustainable water supply system. So it's important to protect our groundwater resources not only because it's difficult to assess and clean up groundwater contamination but also because groundwater contamination can occur for such a long time due to how the groundwater moves in the subsurface. So this is a list of major pollutants and where these pollutants come from. Uh, infectious agents like pathogens that can cause sickness such as bacteria and parasites come from human and animal waste. Oxygen demanding waste or materials that deplete the dissolved oxygen level in the water body that is needed by the aquatic species comes from animal waste as well as plant debris including algae blooms. And that can come from sewage, animal feedlots, food processing facilities, and pulp paper mills. Plant nutrients like nitrates and phosphates can cause excessive growth of algae. And those also can come from sewage, animal waste, as well as inorganic fertilizers that applied to our farm fields. You'll see there's some common themes here for major sources. Organic chemicals add toxins to the aquatic system, and these are typically man-made uh, chemicals, and they come from industry um, application of man-made herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, and pesticides, as well as household hazardous waste, and examples of these are from oil, gasoline, plastic, pesticides, and cleaning solvents as well. Another category is inorganic chemicals and these can come from industry or households or surface water runoff and they typically fall into the category of acids, bases, salts, and the metal compounds are ones that we're concerned about, especially if they contain heavy metals. Sediment is uh, eroded soil material that can disrupt the photosynthesis process in the aquatic environment as well as impact the food web and um, the ways in which uh, fish spawn. It can also block the gills of fish when they're swimming in heavily sediment loaded uh, streams or rivers or lakes. The source of this is from land erosion and it's different types of silt and fine clay particles. In terms of the number one pollutant in the United States nationwide, sediment is the number one pollutant in volume. Here in Pennsylvania, however, it's not sediment, but rather acid mine drainage. So let's look at the next category. Heavy metals can disrupt immune systems, endocrine systems, and impact the neurological system. And heavy metals are considered to be lead, mercury, arsenic, arsenic. also chromium would fit into this category. And these metals can be released into the environment from industrial discharges, coal burning power plants, from mining, from old unlined landfills, as well as potential household hazardous waste and chemicals. And then finally, you can also have thermal pollution occur, which makes some species vulnerable to disease. And this comes from electric power plants and industrial facilities, including nuclear power plants. And basically what they're doing is discharging um, water that is at a higher temperature than the receiving water body, and it causes thermal pollution. So these are the major pollutants and examples of those pollutants and the sources from which they stem from. In the next short video lecture series, we'll be talking about drinking water quality and continuing on with discussing pollution of surface water bodies.